In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and then kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Send forth your Spirit upon us this day, O Lord, as we look at spiritual friendship and how it plays a role in our spiritual, spiritual life. We ask you to be with me as um, I am the instrument of this discussion this day. We ask you to be with all of those who are here, that they might hear it in their own way and maybe even able to share it and grow, uh, uh, grow even deeper than what is being offered through the gift of the Holy Spirit given to them uh, in this day. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, uh, Michelle has two of my books that I, I, I would like them at some point. Uh, I'm going to make re reference to. Uh, today we're going to talk about spiritual friendship. And so we're going to need to talk about friendship. And we're going to need to talk about love to start with. But why are we talking about friendship? Well, I think, you know, with... Uh, with Facebook, the whole meaning of who is a friend has radically changed. And what, you know, and so, you know, how many friends do you have? If I ask you, how many friends do you have? Uh, if you have a Facebook page, all of a sudden people begin to think, you know, well, I have a thousand friends. I have 465 friends. Uh, and in an ancient way of understanding uh, friendship, uh, you might say, I have five friends. I have three friends. I have a friend. Uh, because friendship was a much deeper concept than uh, somebody who follows you on a uh, website. Um, and also, uh, friendship in many senses, is a lost art. Um, the ancient world, friendship one is one of the key relationships that you had. And now uh, we have lots of different kinds of friends, but the kind of friend that in the ancient world they would have been talking about, people have lost a talent for making. And so when we talk about spiritual friendship, we're talking about a very specific kind of deep friendship. It's not just true friendship. Uh, it is, um, although we'll, we'll challenge that too, whether you can have true friendship without it also being spiritual friendship. But uh, we'll, uh, we'll be talking about love and the commandment to love. And if we're commanded to love everyone, does that mean that we have to be friends with everyone? And the answer is, I can give you right up, spoiler alert, the answer is no. Okay? But that doesn't mean that we dismiss the command to love everyone. So let me begin with what, uh, love, first of all. I'm going to uh, just very briefly cover uh, C.S. Lewis's four kinds of love that he talked about. Uh, he talked about uh, storge, uh, or empathy, the empathy bond. It's liking somebody through familiarity, uh, family members or people who are related to you in familiar ways, or otherwise than found, found yourself bonded by chance. All of a sudden, you know, that, that intense feeling that you get when all of a sudden you are with somebody and you're doing something together, uh, that can be that empathy bond that's happening there. It's described as the most natural and emotive and widely diffused kinds of love. It's emotive because it's a result of the fondness due to familiarity and most widely diffused because it pays the least attention to the characteristics during, deemed valuable or worthy of love. And so, as a result, it's able to trans, uh, transcend most discriminating factors. Uh, C.S. Lewis describes it a dependency-based love that risks extinction if the need ceases to exist. How many people have you been on a, um, maybe, especially with this crew, uh, you've been on a tour with one another? 
where you've been on the same bus and you've been traveling with one another for a great deal of time and you end up at the end of that time saying, we need to exchange emails. We need to exchange addresses because we're going to stay in touch with each other. And you never talk to these people again, right? That's this story. It doesn't mean that there wasn't that empathy there, but it's time-conditioned. It's, it's uh, event-conditioned. Um, then... Uh, it, we're t- then he talks about philia, or the friend bond. Um, and his definition, C.S. Lewis' definition, is the love between friends that is close as siblings. He like another brother or like another sister. Uh, the friendship is a strong bond existing between people who share common values, interests, and act- activities. And... C.S. Lewis differentiates uh, friendship love from other loves. He describes friendship as the least biological, organic, instinctive, gregarious. Now, isn't that interesting? Uh, He talks about it's the least gregarious. In other words, with your deepest friends, sometimes you don't even need to talk. You can just be with them in silence. Whereas this uh, empathy love, you know, somebody has to, please, somebody keep the conversation going, right? Uh, So um, he, um, our species does not need friendship in order to reproduce, but to the classical and the medieval world, it was a higher level of love because it is freely chosen. Remember in those time frames, marriage was not something necessarily that you truly, freely chose. Oftentimes, you, uh, it was an arranged marriage. And by the way, uh, this, they've done studies on this. Um, people are equally happy and content in arranged marriages as they are in marriages where they've fallen in love with somebody. Isn't that interesting? There, you know, the marriages are just as successful. There is no statistical difference, you know, between those kinds of marriages with one another. I always thought that that was just a fascinating little tidbit because uh, it really goes against every, everybody says, what do you mean arranged marriages are just as happy? Of course, if you choose your spouse, it's got to be happier. Statistics. I know there are damn statistics too. You know, statistics and then damn statistics. But uh, it, um, it apparently is true. Lewis explains that fr- true friendships like friendship between David and Jonathan in the Bible are almost a lost art. He expresses a strong distaste. This is before Facebook. Can you imagine if he heard about Facebook? So he expresses a strong distaste for the way modern society ignores friendship. He He notes that he cannot remember any poem that celebrated true friendship like that between David and Jonathan and Roland and Oliver and Armis and Amelis. And if you don't remember those folks, it's because those poems are so old that you can't remember them anymore. Um, To the ancients, friendship seemed the happiest and most fully human of all loves. The crown of life, the school of virtue. The modern world, in comparison, he says, ignores it. And it grows, he says that it grows out of companionship. Uh, friendship for Lewis was a deeply appreciative love, the one which he felt few people in modern society could value its worth because so few actually experience true friendship. Remember that C.S. Lewis's uh, most formative friendships uh, were, uh, well, one of them was with uh, uh, Tolkien. And Tolkien said, without the friendship of Lewis, uh, he would never have been able to write and bring to completion the Lord of the Rings. And C.S. Lewis would never, he, uh, and C.S. Lewis said, without Tolkien, he would have never been able to do much of his work with the Christian imagination and also Narnia as well. It was their friendship that allowed them and pushed them to do this. And so he had great, uh, C.S. Lewis had a talent uh, and for friendship. Uh, so nevertheless, Lewis was not blind to the dangers of friendship, such as potential clickiness 
and uh, anti-authoritarianism and pride. And we'll talk about those in the context of spiritual relationship. Eros, the erotic bond, okay? Uh, for Lewis, this was the love in the sense of being in love or loving. Someone, as opposed to the raw, the, it's, this is not raw sexuality, okay? This is, the illustration is the distinction between wanting a woman and wanting one particular woman. Um, and something that is matched in his classical view as man as a rational animal, a composite both of reasoning angel and instinctual alley cat, uh, is the way he put it. Uh, Eros turns to needs pleasure of Venus into the most appreciative of all pleasures. But nevertheless, Lewis warned against the modern tendency for Eros to become a god for people who f fully submit it to them, uh, fully submit themselves to it. A justification for selfishness and even a type of false religion. Um, you know, people, says, when you start talking about uh, how uh, you exercise your sexuality, they say, you know, you have no right to tell me what to do, right? As if there was nothing in our human nature that was right or wrong. In, very, in many ways, they treat their understanding of their own sexuality as their own religion. And so they would say, just as you don't have any right to tell me what, who, what God to follow, you don't have any right to tell me how I live out my life. Well, that is true if you don't think that how we live our sexuality says something about how we are as human beings. But if you believe it does have something to say about what the very nature of what it says to be about a human being, then how we live out that aspect of our love does have a fundamental right or wrong, that which is consistent with being a human being and that which is not consistent with being a human being. Um, and our basic humanness as opposed to just our animal nature, okay? Um, while, accepting, uh, while accepting Eros can be a very extremely profound experience, he does not overlook the dark ways that could lead even to the point of suicide pacts or murder, as well as the fur furious refusals to part. Mercilessly chaining two mutual tormentors. Okay, people, you know, have you ever heard about... Uh, uh, seeing couples that are just bad for each other and they just go at one another all the time and they refuse to let go of each other because somehow in the you know in perverse way they get their identity by be by tormenting the other one okay uh, th this is the wrong side of eros okay um, it's the poison of hate in love and then finally, the fourth type of love is agape love, which is unconditional love, God love. It's the love that serves regardless of changing circumstances. Um, Lewis recognizes this as one of the greatest of the four loves and is seen, seen as specifically a, a Christian virtue to achieve. The chapter on this subject focuses on the need to subordinate the other three natural loves. So the other loves can also be good loves. But in order to, for them to come to their fruition, in order for them to come to their completion, they have to be tutored. They have to be schooled by agape love. So there is a hierarchy of loves, if we want to under, understand it. Um, so now we're going to move on. Those are the different kinds of love. But now we're going to focus in on friendship. The classical definition of friendship, there are, Aristotle had his or uh, other, other people had theirs in the classical world. But the classic definition that has come down to us that most people agree with is the one by Cicero. And Cicero's definition of friendship is this. Friendship is the mutual harmony in affairs human and divine, coupled with benevolence and charity. 
In other words, I find somebody who we are in basic agreement on the way we look at the world, the way, basic agreement. We can have differences, but we're basic agree, disagreement on things of the world and things of God. And because of that, I, I look out for the good of the other, and this friendship leads me to grow deeper in love with, the, with the, those around me. It doesn't just stay in the friendship. It goes out from the friendship. And so it's both the good of the other and going out to the world. Um, St. Boniface defined it this way. A reciprocal relationship of mutual sharing between two persons who see the same spiritual ideals. Now, notice what... uh, Now we're getting into... Uh, in terms of friendship, we're get moving into spiritual friendship. Because for Boniface, true friendship was, in fact, spiritual friendship. And for, for those who use this term, the idea is that if my friendship is just about two people in, uh, facing each other and about each other's needs, to the exclusion of others... It can become uh, isolating. It can be. Beco- it really doesn't ultimately fit the uh, idea of friendship. That's with the clickishness, or um, in later time, and we'll talk about this again. The the phrase. Have you ever heard the phrase particular friendships? Okay. Well, in um, starting in about the 1700s, particularly seven, late 1600s, 1700s. Uh, they, uh, especially in religious orders, they didn't want anybody to have particular friendships. And so you could go always two, never three, but never the same two was the rule of thumb. You, you could go, for, you know, in the community, you could go out uh, for a walk or spend time uh, always two, or wait, uh, on never two, always three. So you weren't supposed to be, you know, with one other person and never the same three, okay? You, so you, you would always, you'd mix, you'd have to be a part of the community. That's where they kind of got a little paranoid about friendship, about the dangers of friendship. Also know that this period of time is also the period of time when Jansenism, was um, a, a, her- a particular heresy in the Catholic Church. It, it looked at human relationships, especially human sexuality, with great suspicion. Okay? So, what's going on? You know, what's going on? What's going on? There was always a suspicion that something was going on. Okay? And if even in marriage, if you were having too much fun, you better get to confession. You know, that, and so, you know, that it was an unhealthy, it was, notice I called it a heresy. It is a heresy, okay? But so that whole idea of particular friendship uh, was something uh, that became a distorted understanding of friendship. But Boniface and those who developed understood spiritual friendship as a, a sharing in a common faith. Uh, the friends support one another in the search of God. And that's the thing that makes spiritual friendship really unique. It's, it, the friendship is not simply for its own sake. Um, it is that in a spiritual friendship, it's not just uh, that you gather because you have these mutual uh, likes, you have these mutual attractions, but that together you are looking to grow in your relationship with God. And that, that's a, a key in understanding spiritual friendship. Um, usually the spiritual friendship involves little or no physical contact. And the feelings of passion are translated to a spiritual level. In people who have an intense spiritual life, 
it ends in the communion of spirits and hearts that are often uh, consummated in the sharing of prayer. Um, I have a, a, a dear friend who I made at the seminary. His name is Father John Ricardo. And um, John and I were very, very close. And I, as I was doing this talk and reading it, I'm actually reading it through the lens of that relationship. And I remember one of the most intimate moments that we ever shared as friends. We, we went on a um, uh, Christmas. We got, this was a year where we uh, were told to travel for Christmas. Every other year, one year we were in the seminary for Christmas, and the next year we were told to travel for Christmas. This year we were told to travel, and John and I ended up in uh, Salzburg uh, for Christmas. And I remember um, specifically uh, doing a holy hour uh, with John in the Franciscan church at Salzburg. And it was the coldest hour I have ever spent in my entire life. I was absolutely freezing, chilled to the bone in this church. And yet, at the same time, our focus not on each other, but our focus on Christ in the Blessed Sacrament as we were praying, that was, uh, for me, one of the key moments in our friendship. Now, we've, we've prayed many, many other times together, but uh, uh, that's one that I remember that kind of helped cement our friendship from, you know, we, uh, we were you know, in, in, interested in theology. We were interested in pasta. Uh, we were... <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we're interested in, you know, uh, we talked politics and all of those sorts of things. But this is one of the things where it transitioned over to spiritual friendship uh, for me. So oftentimes, spiritual friendship will end uh, in prayer, okay? That it's not directed to the other, it is directed to another, uh, to God. Um, such a spiritual communication is often very open and does not disregard the weaknesses of others, but rather it understands them, and why pursuing the spiritual goal to live in patience and imitation of Christ. Um, one last person before we get into ale red. Uh, and, uh, we're going to spend the, uh, most of the, our talk uh, today talking about ale red, and I'll get to him. Uh, ale red or Vervaux. But Gregory the Great, he said, the spiritual life is a type of pilgrimage to God. And that was his image of, of the spiritual life, that we're on a pilgrimage. Remember um, that Gregory the Great uh, is living in the 600s. Okay? So what else is happening in the world in the 600s? The Muslim conquest of the Holy Land. What could you not do anymore? You couldn't go in pilgrimage to Jerusalem. It was unsafe. And so many images of pilgrimage became very important in the, in the Western church. Uh, pilgrimage uh, to the great shrines, uh, to Our Lady of Walsingham. Although Our Lady of Walsingham didn't exist in England yet. That was, that was much later. Uh, but uh, uh, Santiago de Compostela. Um, and then making pilgrimage to even to Rome to, uh, for people to come there to the burial places of Peter and Paul. The Stations of the Cross were developed in the immediate aftermath because people couldn't make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem anymore. They could make a mini pilgrimage to Jerusalem by making this pilgrimage in the church uh, to the Stations of the Cross. Well, Gregory took this and he used it as a metaphor for the spiritual life. And that the desire of God is primary motivation for the Christian pilgrimage. And friendship is the means of sustaining us, sustaining us on the way. That if we're going to be pilgrims, we have to be sustained. And this is God's gift to us to sustain us in the spiritual life. I think that's a beautiful understanding of friendship. Uh, of what God is giving you. Then, now I need the book. Michelle, where are you? There you are. We're going to spend almost the balance, not entirely the balance, but almost the balance of our time 
talking about Aelred of Rouleau, who literally wrote the book about spiritual friendship. Uh, he was a uh, Cistercian monk um, and uh, lived in the, uh, the um, thousand in the, in the thousand about you know that 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 decade of the thousand of that hundred years of the thousands. Um, and I actually shouldn't I actually gave you a better name. Hold on a second. I was so worried about the content that I totally forgot to look at his date. So he, oh, actually a little bit later, 1,110 to 1,167, a long time ago, okay? You know, I always thought it was very interesting, this, this is totally off point, which is for Aelred, who lived who in our mind is ancient, the faith was already ancient. You know, it, you know we think of uh, you know, the, the fact that you know, we, we were our distance from Christ, but in his mind, he was literally almost as, in his mind, that was just as ancient to him as our time is from Christ. And so yet this faith is the same. You know, as, as it passed on. So I, I just find that very interesting. Okay, now to Aelred. Aelred wrote this, and it, uh, this is uh, probably my favorite. I have a couple of different uh, volumes of, of this uh, book, um, Spiritual Friendship, the class, uh, his classic text. Um, but this one is um, a new translation by Paul Dennis Billy, a redemptress, with uh, introductions to every section of the three books. This is a very small treatise, okay? The reason that it's even this big, and it has, it's not that horribly small print, is because there's an introduction to every book, and then there's an introduction to every section of the book, and then there are discussion questions under each section. You can read this in an afternoon. Okay? If you just want to read uh, Aylward. Uh, the other thing is, this is probably not the kind of book you've ever read before because it's much more in line with uh, the, how the ancients would write. They would write in dialogues. And so book one has uh, Aylward talking to a young monk, Ivo, uh, who wants to learn from him. But rather than just being in the disciple-teacher mode, uh, their conversation also underlies the fact that they were great friends. Um, and in that chapter, he talks about the nature of spiritual friendship, okay? Kind of the definitions of spiritual friendship. And then uh, in chapters two, and three, or book two and three, uh, Ivo has died. And now he's talking to uh, one monk that is a peer. Uh, at this point, uh, Eorej is the, now the prior of the abbey. And he's talking to somebody who, in his age-wise, is a peer. And then another younger monk who is obviously a friend of William. So the older monk is named William, and the younger monk is named Ration. Um, and in these conversations, uh, it's interesting, uh, you sometimes what Aylred wants to say is in his mouth, and sometimes he puts what he's trying to say about friendship in the mouth of the other, other, other people. So it's not just, okay, here's the question, and now I'm going to give you the answer, okay? So you have to kind of read these dialogues in this way. The other thing is, which is really interesting, he models in the dialogue some aspects of spiritual friendship. You know, what I mean by that is this is not all doom and gloom. It's not all like, oh, we're just, we have to study only about God and we can't have a smile on our face and, you know, we've got to be so serious about the topics that we're talking about. They have fun with each other. They're pulling jokes on one another. 
But it, uh, what? Well, they're speaking Latin to one another, but this is written in a very nice English. Okay? Okay. But, uh, yeah, the original text is in Latin. Uh, but they're, they're um, you know, as friends will do, they, they kind of banter back and forth, but it's always kind. It's always, and then it, it's not ribald. It, it's not uh, superfluous. It's always to the point. So you get a sense of the kind of relationship that they had with one another, which is, which is very interesting, and the kind of subjects that you talk about. So, true friend, and Ailred said this, true friendship is the perfection of false friendships. It's not their opposite. What do I mean by that? If there's lots of different kinds of friends, right? You can have a friend for the journey. You can have a pen pal. You can have a, a friend for a period of time because you're in the same neighborhood or in the same job. Uh, you can have uh, somebody who is uh, uh, the kind of friend, uh, let's, let's put it in uh, the bad sense, which is uh, somebody who is, uh, uh, have what they say, a carnal friendship with one another and not in marriage. Uh, all of those are not the opposite of, friend, of true friendship or spiritual friendship, but there are elements of good in each that have gotten perverted or are not brought to full completion. And spiritual friendship brings all of those things to perfection. Why do I say that? Because in heaven, every relationship will be brought to perfection. There is no relationship uh, that will not, uh, even the false friendships that we might have, that will not be brought to perfection. Uh, and so, Ewed uh, talks about three types of friendship. He talks about carnal friendship, uh, which has a sort of charity due to natural affection, but lacks goodwill. In other words, I, I, I'm a friendship because I'm attracted to you. I'm, I, I have something, but I don't necessarily, um, you know, am willing to die for you. I, I'm not looking out for your needs. I'm looking out for literally what you can do for me. Okay? Um, and so it lacks goodwill. Whereas there's another kind of friendship, which is worldly friendship. And it has a, this is a rational choice, necessary for good, but lacks charity. Or uh, another category, uh, by the way, in, in the first one, carnal friendship, in a later chapter, he'll, he'll do these same three, uh, the first two, and then the third is always spiritual friendship. And that carnal friendship he'll also call puerile friendship. Okay? Uh, in other words, you know, the friendship of little children, okay? Uh, if they're quick, you know, they're quick to come and quick to go. Okay? They don't last. Uh, worldly friendship, his other name for it is the friendship of advantage. That, you know, uh, I, I become friends because you can do something for me. You know, I'm in, in, the, in the workplace, this is often. And I don't get me wrong, those friendships can be good friendships. But when you move on from that job, how many of those friendships endure? Uh, now, if they have endured, that's a sign that you at some point moved. You, you perfected that, or you did not perfected, but that friendship moved from an, um, a worldly friendship to a spiritual friendship. They moved to a different, into a different direction. Um, world spiritual friendship, and here only charity and goodwill are combined. He also says, whoever abides in friendship will abide in God. And this is how he connects the two. That if you are going to be, you know, he believed that true friendship 
is a permanent relationship. And therefore, if you find yourself no longer friends with somebody, that was not really a true friendship. It was a friendship for a time, but it was not a true friendship as he's defining what friendship is. The friendship by its very nature is eternal. It, it, doesn't, it just doesn't end in this world, it goes into the next. Okay? Um, but it is also imperfect friendship that will be perfected at the last judgment. Every, every friendship will be perfected at the end of time. True friendship doesn't require a superhuman degree of goodness. Okay, just because you might be thinking, oh my goodness, if this is the definition of friendship, I don't think I can ever have a friend. No, you can have a friend. You don't have to be perfect. In fact, friends are not perfect. Um, but it does require uh, to be fully, it does require ultimately a desire to be good. A desire to be a saint. He will later, in, uh, and I'm skipping ahead of my notes uh, here, he will later say that a person who is not committed to the moral life really can't have any friends. Because you're not committed to growing in what it means to be a human being. You, you may have acquaintances, you have many people you know who are advantageous, but his position is, that somebody who is committed to uh, an immoral life, by definition, can't have a true friend. So think about that. Okay. Um, true friendship. Um, uh, uh, then he talks about uh, friendship in in terms of intimacy. He talks about it in three different levels. You might have gotten this like spree. I wonder why. Trinity, you know. He talks about the carnal kiss or the corporal kiss, the spiritual kiss, and the intellectual kiss. The carnal kiss or the corporal kiss can be a good thing. It when it's uh, in the context of friends. Uh, whether there, in his day and age, if uh, people uh, gave the sign of peace to one another, it was a kiss. And by the way, if you're uh, long friends, long separate, if you ever go to Italy, you, you do the bach, the bach, you do the, the kiss on both cheeks. You know, men and women, men to men, and women to women, and it means nothing, okay? Other than you're, you're meeting a good friend, okay? First time somebody came up and did me, I was a little taken aback. You know, this, this uh, <laughs> Irish American, uh, you know, it's, uh, it wasn't exactly my culture, but I, I've sort of become part Italian, so I can slip into that uh, when, when I can slip, you can see I can part Italian, <laughs> otherwise I, I couldn't speak if I did this. <laughs> um, but uh, in that context, I understand it. He talks about marriage, that in marriage, the, the carnal kiss or the, or the corporal kiss uh, belongs in, in terms of uh, certain relationships that are leading to marriage. But he then he talks about that this is an easy one to pervert. This is an easy one to cross the line. Um, and uh, that uh, then, then he talks about the spiritual kiss. And I, I have a lot to say about the spiritual kiss because this is the one that is given between spiritual friends. The intellectual kiss is actually the highest kiss, and I'll get to that. So this is what he says, and these are direct quotes from him. It's not made by contact with mouths, but by the affection of hearts. Not made by the mingling of lips, but of spirits. By the purification of all things in God, it emits the celestial savor. I would call that this kiss of Christ, uh, but he, I would call this the kiss of Christ. But he does not offer it with his own mouth, but from the mouth of another. 
breathing upon his lovers but most sac- of that most sacred affection, so there seems to be one spirit in many bodies. So it's not, it's made spirit to spirit in this kiss. It's not, this is not about a contact, a contact of, of lips. And so this is this understanding of spiritual friendship, of this great intimacy that really doesn't need physical contact. It's, it's the two spirits are aligned in their basic desire to love God. And because they have this basic alignment, they find themselves drawn to one another. Isn't this, you know, this is the whole mystery of the communion of saints. So uh, this idea of spiritual friendship is that on the way, God gives us, uh, and uh, particular people, to help us on the way. But we have to go in search of these friends, too. We can't be passive and say, well, no. God meant to be on the way, so when are they going to knock on my door? Okay, so we're going to, um, we're going to talk about how you select uh, spiritual friends. Now, intellectual friends. Intellectual, uh, the intellectual kiss. The intellectual kiss is an experience of the intimacy of God. And so it's the perfection. So the carnal kiss is perfected in the spiritual kiss, and the spiritual <coughs> kiss is perfected in the intellectual kiss. It's that, that moment, that sweet moment, when all of a sudden you know the presence of God, the experience of God, you feel in His, his, in his embrace. I, I remember one moment particularly when I had this experience. Um, I was, it was doing my... Uh, uh, 40 hours ago, or my, my uh, 30 day retreat. Uh, and it was one afternoon, it was my uh, third holy hour for the day, which came right after dinner. And um, uh, the, the, uh, I would do one in the morning, uh, one in the afternoon, uh, one uh, right. Uh, uh, after dinner, and then one right before I went to bed. And, um, because that's, that's what you're supposed to do on uh, this, uh, these 30 day retreats. You're supposed to do at least uh, uh, three holy hours. So. Um, and, uh, so what I would do, actually, no, I did, there were five. I'm sorry, there was two in the morning. I forgot, there were two in the morning. I'm sorry, I just got to get it straight in my head. So it was the, not the last one that I did. Uh, but the, the one before that. And uh, that experience was all of a sudden, I was in the 55th minute of my holy hour. And all of a sudden, I was just aware of everything. That God was in everything. And all of a sudden, the, the, the greens and the light were just suffused with God for me. And it was being aware of that in that moment. That's the intellectual kiss. It's a moment of sweetness. It's a moment of deep intimacy. And it doesn't last that long. It, it, it lasted probably for about 10 minutes. And then it just kind of flittered away. And then I spent another hour just giving God thanks for it. Uh, it, was, it was pretty amazing. But that is, you know, in a spiritual friend, this, the idea is that as you grow in your intimacy for, with one another, that it leads you to this intimacy with God. It, the relationship itself is not the final place, but also means to, it's perfected in this other friendship uh, with God. Um, now, in the dialogue, the other two monks says, this sounds like a lot of hard work. You know, why should we do this? <clears throat> and Aylred says, a man is a beast who does not have friends. In other words, we're not living according to our humanity. Our very human nature requires us to have friends. It is not good for man to be alone. And God did not just mean that 
in the context of marriage relationship. Jesus did not call us, uh, and with all due respect to our, our evangelical brothers and sisters, in the first place, Jesus did not call us to be have a deep and personal intimate relationship with him. In the first place, he called us to be his church. He called us to be his body. And then, he wants to have a deep and personal and intimate relationship with us. You know, Jesus is making us for, God has made us for community. Now, that's where the, the law of charity is. We have to love everyone because of that. But do we have to be friends with everyone? No! Because we live in a fallen world, right? And ultimately, all of those relationships will be perfected into spiritual friendship. Literally, we will be friends with everyone. Deep and personal and intimate friends with everyone. Okay? Even the person you hate right now. If you're all in heaven, you ultimately have to be our friend. Okay? But in this fallen world, we need to discern who we let in. There should be relationships of trust that happen here. So the other thing is that um, this is a very different relationship than a lover. Even a husband and wife who move from eros, that kind of sexual love, to agape, to self-giving love to one another, uh, experiences, because and they also have friendship. Uh, marriages partake in all of these different types of love that C.S. Lewis talks about. But friends, uh, a, a good friendship, not an unhealthy friendship, uh, lovers face each other. And they look for love by looking into the eyes of the other. Friends look out in the same direction, side by side. And so they're headed in the same direction. They have the same goal, human and divine in divine matters. But they're, they're not, it's not ultimately about the other. It's ultimately about the companionship of being on the way together. And that's where the intimacy is. Um, how do I choose a spiritual friend? How many categories do you think he has in how to choose a spiritual friend? <coughs> yes, well, I, I said come up to that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually, uh, one is kind of one is kind of uh, a wrap up. So you're right. You're right. Is uh, about the three too. We're both. You're both right. So the first is selection. We we select somebody who we think we're compatible with. We um, we think uh, somebody who is loyal. Uh, Ability, somebody who has frank, believes we can be frank with us, somebody who we are in sympathy with, there's congeniality, we, we like spending time with them, um, somebody with whom we're not going to be suspicious, uh, that's a, and then there has to be a, a, a radical equality. So there are, we have the example of David and Jonathan. Now, we might think, because we know the end of the story, that David's going to become king. Uh, but remember that David was originally uh, a servant of, of, of Saul. And originally, Jonathan was going to be the king. And so Jonathan had to come down to David's level, and David is elevated to Jonathan's level so that they are a friendship of equals. You can't have a friendship of higher and lower. Um, what are some disqualifying things that he talks about? Now, he, here, there are not three. There are not even four. There's five. Okay? These are things that would, uh, 
You shouldn't admit these people into your friendship. You should love them. You should have charity for them. But these are, are kind of disqualifying features. Um, notice one of the disqualifying features is not that the other person is not perfect. Okay? You know, that the other person hasn't sinned. Uh, it's very specific types of things that we look at. Uh, first, those who slander. Those who say things about you that whether they're true or not, whether people believe them or not, uh, if somebody is, uh, slanders you, uh, you should not admit them into your friendship. Those who correct you publicly, I'm not talking about your mother or father when you're, you know, five years old, but, but those who correct you publicly, those who reproach you, uh, because that, that sets up resentment in terms of, uh, of the relationship. Uh, those who lack humility and the ability to admit their own guilt, their own fault. Uh, you know, they, they're more than happy to tell you what's wrong with you. But God help you if you would mention that there might be a fault in their life, okay? You know, they would never admit that they were wrong or they were at fault. Uh, also, uh, secret detraction. They, they talk about you behind your, behind your back. They undercut. Uh, and they say, don't tell this to, you know, uh, don't tell this to somebody, you know. You know, they're, they're trying to keep it secret, but you know, those things always get back. And finally, uh, those who disclose your secrets. Okay? Those are the folks. There's a whole panoply of stuff. There's a whole, whole series of faults that can, somebody can have that are not included in there. Okay? Now, he said you should also be cautious. Those are disqualifying things. There are three things that he mentions that you should be cautious about, okay, when selecting somebody to be a spiritual friend. And those, those uh, dis uh, disposed to excessive anger, um, those who are fickle, you know, one minute they're, they blow this way, the next minute they blow that way, and those who are very suspicious. So, Aylred uh, actually had a friend who was known as a very irascible monk. And so he was, he was questioned by the other two monks. Well, well what about this friend of yours? Is that, isn't that is uh, your own definition? Isn't that a disqualifying, uh, uh, disqualifying uh, figure because this guy is so irascible? And he says, he's never irascible. And in fact, in our relationship, I find that even with others, uh, all I have to do is give them a look or a nod, and all of a sudden I can calm him down. And so one of the things in friendship is that the other person wants to be a better person because of your friendship. And so that, so he said, that's why, uh, that's not a disqualifying figure, but you should have caution. Um, I want to go back uh, for a moment. Uh, when I said, uh, in terms of the, uh, how you select a friend, uh, I said there was, uh, okay.
maybe share our books with them, and see if you can begin to trust them. And then after that probationary period, and I can't tell you how long that is, at another point you just, there is an admission. You admit them into this secure, this place of friendship. And that is a final act. Okay? You, you're making a commitment. I am now this person's friend forever. And, and once you do that, it would, it, you should um, only distance yourself from that friend after a great deal of prayer and struggle. Because that commitment, that admission into your life, friends are very important. Friends are, uh, we need friends. All of us need friends uh, to grow in the spiritual life, to grow in our relationship with God, to grow in our own understanding of humanity. We need this intimacy. Um, so once that admission happens, uh, then the next step is perfect harmony in matters of human and divine with charity and benevolence, which is just a slight rewording of the definition of friendship by Cicero. And what he's saying is that <coughs> Once you establish this, that the true friendship, Cicero was talking about all sorts of different kinds of friends, but his understanding is that true friendship really ultimately is spiritual friendship. That, that we really, uh, if we're really talking about other kinds of friendship, they, they, are, they really have other categories. They are imperfect friendships. It doesn't mean that they're false friendships, but they're imperfect friendships. But the only true friendship, the only permanent, eternal friendship, is in fact spiritual friendship. And then, therefore, he accepts Cicero's definition once you do all this other work. Because Cicero didn't know Jesus. Cicero didn't know Christ. And so you have to do all of this work specifically as Christians to understand what friendship is about. What happens if... Or what, are, what are the limits of friendship? Do you let your friend get away with anything? Will you do anything for your friend? Well, Elred takes from Scripture um, that Jesus' definition that um, a true friend will lay his life down for the young. So that's the limit of friendship. If you need to lay your life down for your friend, you would do that. But there are parameters to this. And the parameters is no true friend would ask you to break your relationship with God. And if they're trying to do that, if they're trying to make you choose between uh, following God's law and following them because they've made another decision, then there, there really is a true friendship on their, their part. And so you may need to withdraw from that friendship. And how do you do that? Not all at once. Not finally. Because there is hope that there might be reconciliation. He talks about withdrawing from a friendship stitch by stitch. And uh, because there's always a possibility of, of readmission into friendship if uh, there is uh, an asking of a, of a desire for forgiveness, a desire to change. Um, and that friendship is made up of love, affection, security, and happiness. And what he talks about is untying the stitches, that you are untying the last three. Not relying on your happiness because of this friend. Realizing that you're not secure anymore in trusting this, this person. Um, that affection itself might die away because of these acts. But the one thing he says has to remain is love. Because love itself will be perfected. And there's, like I said, as a possibility, 
you never want to cut the person off from the possibility of restoration to friendship. Especially if <laughs> friends are hard to make. And so if there is a problem, you want to do everything you can to restore the friendship. Um, you, uh, let me see. Let me, uh, pretty much that's the end of, of Aored, uh in terms of, I, I really love his book. It's one of my favorite books, and it's a great book to read through, um, as I did, through some of your relationships, kind of analyzing it as you read through it. Uh, but I want to bring up uh, two examples of spiritual friends to end this talk. And the first are, are the, both of them are very famous. The first one you probably are very much aware of, which is Francis and Claire. Uh, Francis and Claire had, I was saying Francis and Claire, had this amazing relationship. But one of the things that's fascinating about their relationship is they, over a period of 20 years, they hardly ever saw one another. They hardly had any physical or direct contact with one another. Those occasions where they did get together, uh, what we have from the testimony of people, it was palpable, the attraction. Now, unlike the Zipperelli film, which kind of shows them to be kind of peers of the same age, and you kind of uh, think that, oh, were they really in love with one another, and they were uh, submerging us into their love of God? No, they were about 20 years apart as well, uh, in, in terms of age. And, but Claire, very much like Mary, Mary is the perfect disciple of Jesus. And Claire was the perfect disciple of Francis. She got it. She knew the mission. And there was an intimacy about the mission and the desire. So in spiritual friendship, this, this understanding that we're on the same mission with one another. You may not be in religious life, but you very much can have this understanding of spiritual friendship that doesn't require constant contact with one another. Now, there should be contact. Hopefully, and, uh, you know, about deeper things than just, you know, what's the weather, you know, what movie did you see, what book did you read, you know, but about, about the main mission of your life, the main mission of our faith, the main mission of your particular vocation, to share that with, be able to share that with somebody, tremendous intimacy. Um, that's why one of the things that I try to do is get spouses to pray for one another. Because many spouses, they love one another. They're very attracted to one another, but they are not yet spiritual friends. And as I said, marriage is capable of having multiple relationships um, in, in it. It's, uh, but you can have also chaste relationships outside of marriage, both with male and female. Um, and, and Claire and Francis are an example of that. Another great example of this is Francis de Sales and Jean de Chantal. Uh, Francis de Sales was the uh, Bishop of Geneva, uh, Switzerland, although he lived in France uh, because of the Protestant Reformation. But through his preaching and kind of coming into Geneva from time to time, he was part of the great Catholic counter-reformation and great, huge, you know, great swaths of Europe came back to the faith uh, through his preaching. Uh, Jean de Chantal uh, was a wife, a mother, uh, then a widow, and then a, finally a founder of a religious order herself, the Visitation Sisters, uh, which uh, we have some in, in this, in this uh, diocese as well. And St. Fra uh, uh, Francis uh, de Sales, who, the word that you can say about him, he was a gentleman. And all that contains. I mean, he was a Christian <coughs> gentleman. He was, uh, he was just, people loved being in his presence. Uh, he was a very attractive personality. And he became,
became her spiritual director. But rather quickly uh, in this relationship, it, and from going from a spiritual director to a spiritual director, and I have a relate, I have a, I have a type of friendship with my spiritual director, but there is also um, in our relationship, it's kind of necessary to, uh, to not be at this level, okay? But they, but they were able to negotiate that, where they became equals, and uh, she was helping him, and as he was helping her, and it was almost done entirely through letters. They almost never met. And it was these great letters. She actually burned most of her letters uh, to France. To, um, to, uh, in the old days and age, when you wrote a letter, you wrote a copy for yourself. Okay? That, that was this is the least documented uh, uh, epic in human history. But people used to keep letters of their own letters, uh, you know, copies of their own letters. That's why we have these books of letters. And then, uh, but Francis, but Francis uh, kept a good many of her letters and kept uh, his letters as well. So we have um, a good stock of their letters to each other um, that you can have. And there's this deep, intimate relationship as they're helping each other on this journey to God. And, um, you know, people, when they read letters, they must have been in love. Well, yes, they were in love, but people can't understand how somebody could be in love and not, you know, be the old, when you're hearing that sounding, uh, think that they, they weren't thinking about sex. Well, in spiritual friendship, it is possible. Spiritual friendship, most often, I would say, most often, is between people of the same sex. Um, but there are these examples of these great spiritual friendships that are very important to recapture, like uh, St. Francis of Sales and St. John de Chantal. Um, I, uh, this is uh, one of the, the topics in spirituality that I think is so essential, um, particularly for me. Uh, I think it's one of my gifts to be able to give to you. Many of you are married, and many of you do have a spiritual friend in your spouse. And uh, sometimes I also, though, I see people in the parish who are incredibly lonely, okay? Because they have not allowed true friendship, deep friendship in their lives. They get very scared about this because there is a, a vulnerability that has to happen in this kind of friendship that is very scary. It also can go wrong unless you're praying, unless you're using the sacraments. It can get redirected because we have to watch our own fallen human nature in us. But I think one of my gifts to give back to the church is the example of the spiritual friendships that I do have. And I have a very rather significant friends. I've talked about that in, in homilies before some of the people who are my very significant friends, and they are the ones that help make me want to be a holier person. They want, they push me to be a better priest. They help me to understand that in my relationship and the intimacy that I experience with them, God is reaching out to me at the same time. So that's why I, I, I think that this is, although Friendship is not a topic we talk a lot about. Uh, sometimes we, we give it, we don't talk about it. You know, since we were in grade school, you know, in grade school we talked about who was my friend, who was my best friend. You know, and then we don't talk about it as much. But I, this needs to come back into our lexicon. It needs to come back into our minds that we seek out spiritual friends. Because they help us to be the person God makes. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.